So hi guys and welcome to lesson two of the geochemical data series. So in this lesson I'm going to be talking about the rare earth elements. So the rare earth elements are a group of typically trivalent metals that have similar physical and chemical properties and the, most group, the, the group that we're most commonly concerned with are referred to as the lanthanides. So these are a group of 15 rare earth elements that have atomic numbers ranging from 57 to 71 and each of these have an electron in the 5d shell. They have a valence electron in the 5d shell shell and you can look at the structure of atoms in one of the lessons at the start of the igneous petrology series. We do have a second group of rare earth elements referred to as the actinides. We're not typically concerned with these um, in geology due to the fact that they don't often occur in nature but these are a group of 15 rare earth elements that have atomic numbers ranging from 89 to 103 and these don't occur in nature typically because they are radioactive. The rare earth elements are split into LRE, MRE and HRE, which is the light, middle and heavy rare earth elements respectively. And then at the base I have a couple of uh, processes at the bottom that I think are worth bringing up. So we have the lanthanide contraction, which is a phenomenon whereby the ionic radius, so the size of the atoms of the lanthanides decreases as we increase the atomic number. So as we increase the atomic number, we're decreasing the ionic radii. So those protons are pulling in those electrons and making the, uh, the atom essentially smaller. And because of the lanthanide contraction, this sort of reduction in size happens at a greater rate than expected. And below that, we have the Otto Harkins rule. So the Otto Harkins rule is where an element with an even atomic number is typically more abundant in nature than adjacent elements with an odd atomic number. And I'll go on to that in a moment as well. So in geology, we use rare earth elements to evaluate processes such as mantle melting, fractional crystallization and crustal contamination. All the elements are typically trivalent. I'll give some examples of exceptions to that rule at the end of this presentation. And each of these elements are considered incompatible to some degree. And how we present these uh, elements are typically on what's referred to as spider diagrams or spidergrams or multi-element diagrams. What we have along the x-axis is our lanthanides in order of increasing atomic number or increasing compatibility or decreasing ionic radius, you know, decreasing ion radius because of that lanthanide contraction, right? And then at the y-axis, we have concentration and we typically normalize the concentration to a known reservoir because of the Otto Harkins rule. And I'll go on to that in the next slide. I've highlighted here all the elements from lanthanum to lutetium, but I've added in promethium here. Um, promethium is the only lanthanide that isn't generally found in nature, so don't be alarmed when it's missing from uh, spider diagrams in any literature that you read. So why do we normalize? So normalization is essentially the process of taking the rare earth element concentrations of our sample and dividing them by the rare earth element concentrations of a known reservoir, such as a chondrite or primitive mantle. And we do this because of the Otto Harkins effect. The Otto Harkins effect was first reported by Giuseppe Otto and William Harkins, who published works on this in 1914 and 1917 respectively. So if we take this diagram here and we plot them in order of increasing atomic number, we can see we have all the elements of the periodic table that we know and love. And this is pretty difficult to interpret if we spread this out for rocks. And as you can see, elements that have even atomic numbers are much higher in abundance than adjacent elements with odd atomic numbers. So when we normalize, we essentially smooth this pattern, we smooth this curve. And we do something like this. So to counteract the Otto Harkins rule, we normalize, i.e. divide our sample with concentrations of a known reservoir. And then we go from what's considered to be this gray line here. So we have, you know, zigzag patterns due to the Otto Harkins effect. But after we normalize, we have these smooth patterns. So we go from gray to red. And it is these smooth red patterns that are much easier to interpret. Um, we can, we can normalize to a number of different reservoirs, the most common of which being chondrites or primitive mantle, but also to things such as upper crust, lower crust, n-morbs, or even samples in your own data set. Um, so as you can imagine, normalization can be quite subjective um, and task specific. So you'd have to normalize based on the job you were doing. So interpreting replots, I could spend a lot of time talking about how we interpret rare earth element diagrams for different processes, but this is really just an introduction. Um, so firstly, I'll take this diagram on the left, which you may be familiar with from textbooks. So I'll just read the caption. So these are rare earth element concentrations at the bottom here, normalized to chondrite. So we have our sample divided by chondrite values for melts produced at various values of F. F means partial melting via melting of a hypothetical garnet lursolite using batch melting. <clears throat> So each of these lines corresponds to some degree of melts from a mantle peridotite. 
Um, we have, uh, so this is essentially represents the composition of a melt of a 5% melt, 10%, 20%, 40%, 60%. .00. So first, if we take our 5% melt, so we've taken our garnet lursolite, we've melted it, we've melted it by 5%. And what you notice is that we have very steep curves here. We have quite a large enrichment in light rare earth elements, and we have a relative depletion in heavy rare earth elements. And this is because of that order of compatibility, right? We're increasing compatibility this way. So these Elri, the slightly more incompatible elements, are preferentially enriched in the melt. So that's why we have a much higher degree of light rare earth elements in the melt relative to heavy rare earth elements. And as we increase the degree of partial melting, the concentrations of Elri relative to HRE are much smaller. And that's because these incompatible elements that were enriched in the smaller phases of melt are becoming diluted by the, uh, by the liberation of other elements. And also the reason that the heavy rare earth element concentrations are so low respectively to Elri's, is that eight heavy rare earth elements are compatible within garnet, so we'd have to melt all of the garnet to liberate the heavy rare earth elements from the source. So now if we take this diagram on the right, which shows us rare earth element patterns of some common reservoirs, such as ocean island basalt, e-morb, n-morb, etc. These are again chondrite normalised, and as you can see it's logarithmic on the side now. We have primitive mantle, which is flat, so it's essentially three times the rare earth element concentration of uh, chondrite, which is our normalization factor. And we can see that L-morbs, E-morbs, and OIBs have quite different patterns that we can use to compare with our unknown samples. So say we have a sample that's quite enriched in light rare earth elements and respectively depleted in heavy rare earth elements, we could see that it's more akin to ocean island basalts relative to normalized mid-ocean ridge basalts. And this is quite important then for determining things like tectonic setting. Um, so you see ocean island basalts may have undergone more fractionation to be enriched in light rare earth elements, or they may have undergone lower degrees of mantle melting, etc, etc. So as I said before, all rare earth elements are trivalent, but there are some exceptions to this, and europium is one of them. So in reduced environments, europium 3+, so trivalent europium, can become europium 2+, or divalent europium. And europium 2 plus is similar in size and charge to calcium 2 plus, and thus it becomes compatible in plagioclase feldspar due to the substitution of calcium 2 plus for europium 2 plus. So when we look at this diagram here, we have our rare earth elements across the bottom, and we have our normalized samples along the y axis. Instead of having a red line here where it's smooth all the way down, we can generate what's known as europium anomalies, where we can produce a trough, which is a negative europium anomaly, or a peak, which is a positive europium anomaly. And these are calculated by the equation I've listed here. So we have a chondrite normalized europium divided by chondrite normalized samarium and gadolinium to the power of 0.5. And we use samarium and gadolinium because they are the two elements adjacent to europium. And note that negative europium means values below 1, and positive europium means values above 1. So negative anomalies suggest that europium has been removed from our samples, either by plagioclase remaining in the source, or the fact that some plagioclase is crystallised. So in a reduced system then, europium 2 plus has been compatible in plagioclase, so either some plagioclase in the source hasn't been melted and has retained some of that europium, or that during transit between the mantle and the crust, our magma has crystallized some plagioclase and thus removed some of that europium. In contrast, positive anomalies, so those values above 1, suggest that our rock has primary plagioclase in it, so it hasn't lost any europium 2 plus during mantle melting or fractional crystallization, and that we've had primary plagioclase and that it might have been accumulated, so we might have primary plagioclase cumulates. Another exception to the rule is cerium anomalies, and they operate in a very similar way to europium anomalies. In oxidized environments, trivalent cerium can become tetravalent. It can become cerium 4 plus. Cerium 4 plus has a much lower solubility and may nucleate as cerium dioxide, or it can substitute in minerals in replace of things such as zirconium 4 plus or hafnium 4 plus in minerals such as zircon. So, you know, we can measure the cerium anomalies in rocks, but we can also measure cerium anomalies in minerals such as zircon. And just as before, instead of our smooth line, we can have negative serum anomalies or positive serum anomalies via the calculation here, which is still chondrite normalized. But instead of samarium and gadolinium, we now have the adjacent elements to cerium, which is lanthanum and praseodymium. So I hope you found this helpful. Stay in the loop by clicking subscribe and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next lesson.